Of course, you know very well how strong animals are in the wild. Their deadly instincts work with lightning speed, and they can easily kill a weak person if they approach them at the wrong moment. Man-eating lions in our time bring chilling terror to the aborigines of Africa. After all, man is the easiest prey. Sharks hunt in coastal waters for swimmers who are completely defenseless against an underwater threat. Crocodiles in the water lie in wait for unwary tourists who are too careless about the guide's warnings. But there's something that kills 10 times more people every year than crocodiles, a hundred times more than lions, a thousand times more than sharks, and even more than all the toothy and fanged beasts put together. And it's been doing this for millennia. And who is this tyrant over the human race? A snail. According to the estimates of the World Health Organization, already in our century, more than 200,000 people die annually from diseases associated with these mollusks. And now you'll learn how innocent snails do it. We have something in common with these cold, wet, sticky creatures. The unexpected, disgusting answer is right in front of you. It's a schistosome, a parasitic flatworm. The life cycle of a parasite is very complex. At one of these stages, it's adapted to live and consume reserves in the snail's body using it as an intermediate carrier. And in the next stage, the worm enters the human body in order to complete its life cycle and provide a way to lay eggs to repeat self-reproduction over and over again. The parasite begins to literally devour human health within minutes of entering our body. After washing or bathing in contaminated water, cercarii get on the skin and begin to quickly penetrate inside. They will have no other chance to survive but to use our body for their own purposes. And so, they dissolve human skin with caustic enzymes, pierce it with a special spike on their tail, bite into everything they can, everything in order to penetrate inside us and gain access to a plentiful food supply, multiply, and ensure the survival of their kind. Schistosomes are perfectly adapted to move through the blood vessels and using the branched network of passages, penetrate the heart then into the lungs and so on. They conduct reconnaissance and seize internal organs one by one until they find a secluded, quiet place. Once there, the schistosome decides to build a cozy family nest for itself. To do this, it has everything it needs. Living space for laying eggs and an almost unlimited supply of food. The flow of nutritious blood will not dry out as long as the person is alive, providing a constant supply of resources that ensure a carefree life for the parasite. For the human host, problems begin from the first minutes of infection. Despite the maximum size of the parasite of four-tenths of a millimeter, within 10 minutes after infection, a person begins to experience severe itching and scabies. His skin turns red and irritated. He feels constant discomfort, but he's not able to understand the nature of the problem on his own. During the day, a skin rash appears after being gnawed by the parasite. However, after a few days, these signs will disappear and the carrier sighs with relief. Everything seems to have gone away by itself. It was just a short-term allergy and there's no cause for concern but he doesn't suspect what mortal danger awaits him. After all, this was only a delay. The time needed for the parasite to change the stages of development of the larva and spread through the internal organs of its new host. The host then decides that all health problems are solved, but unwittingly only gave the schistosomes time to breathe so that they could build up a reserve of forces and find a safe place for themselves before launching the deadly attack. It starts suddenly. The toxins released by the parasite poison the body every day. As a protective measure, the human body tries to raise its temperature, but this will no longer help. At first, fever, 
chills, headache, and swelling of the throat and airway develop. It seems to the patient that all the Egyptian curses have fallen upon them at once, but this is only the beginning. This condition is the last warning to a person to seek urgent medical treatment. Otherwise, the schistosomes will continue their work. The parasite's eggs will drift through the body and constrict the ducts of blood, lymph, and bile. In no more than two months, the blood composition of an infected person will change. Sometimes the illness will seem to recede, which causes temporary relief of the patient's condition and gives them false hope. In fact, this relief is simply associated with the cycles of egg-laying by the schistosomes, and this is all just a short-term regrouping of the enemy. Soon, the war of annihilation resumes again with renewed vigor, damage to the nervous system, confused speech, difficulties with movement and orientation in space, and finally, convulsions. I will spare you from the terrible further events, because you've already heard and seen the mortality statistics from schistomiasis at the very beginning of my story, and you yourself can guess the final outcome. All of this looks disgusting, but there's good news for many of us. The parasite and its intermediate carriers, snails, exist only in tropical regions, where the most suitable conditions for life are available to them, high humidity and hot weather. In other climatic conditions, these mollusks are not able to survive, and in their absence, it's impossible to complete the cycle of development of the parasitic worm. The disease threatens only tourists who get bored with the standard rest at resorts with disinfected water and want to break away from the office to see true nature. But in many natural habitats, almost 100% of the local population is infected with the parasite. In poor countries such as Nigeria, South Africa, and Zimbabwe, people suffer from extremely low-quality health care. Due to problems with water treatment, locals drink directly from dirty natural reservoirs. Fortunately, snails don't live in sea and ocean water, so they cannot spread around the globe and will remain within their rivers and lakes. So some will decide that there is no danger. But look here. Before you is the well-known Colorado potato beetle. Despite the name, it's originally from the northeast of Mexico. But it seems that this beetle now considers the whole world its homeland. In the middle of the 19th century, it used the economic activities of man and the huge volumes of freight and migrated to North America, where it liked the fields of potatoes very much. Then, at the beginning of the 20th century, during the First World War, it managed to seize a bridgehead and gain a foothold in occupied positions in Europe. In the 70s, the beetle was already evaluating the quality of the shoots of local potatoes in the South Urals. And today, the insect has already conquered freezing Siberia and is advancing its northern front towards the Far East by 40 to 50 kilometers a year. Until recently, no one had any idea that the Mexican beetle was able to carry out such an expansion and adapt to life in harsh conditions. This small example shows that perhaps one day, snails that spread the parasitic worm can follow the example of the Colorado potato beetle, and soon you can expect their appearance where people are not at all ready for them. Now for a surprise. It's time. French parasitologist Jérôme Boissier of the University of Perpignan at an international conference in Montpellier discovered the truth that shocked the scientific community. Schistosomes did the impossible. They didn't wait for the host snail to evolve and start spreading it across Europe. The parasites themselves made the first move and adapted to a new snail. They formed interspecific hybrids and thus acquired superpowers. 
new schistosomes, mutants, targeted local snails in Corsica as an intermediate carrier, and with great success, began to parasitize in their bodies. And immediately after, they looked for a host human. Why worms need a human, you already understand. There was no shortage of bathers in the Corsican rivers. It was only when schistosomiasis was diagnosed in people who had never been to the tropics that scientists began to unwind this mystery, which is how they came to discover the infected Corsican snail. It's a pity for the inhabitants of the continents, who, unlike the residents of the tropics, have not adapted to the fight against schistosoma during their coexistence for thousands of years. After all, if the Colorado potato beetle is relatively harmless to humans, a mutated parasite can literally destroy our civilization. Even now, using the example of emerging new viruses, we see that humanity is able to successfully cope with a pandemic only if there are reserves and a small number of cases, when the infection invades hundreds of thousands of organisms of the Homo sapiens species. But what if hundreds of millions, or even billions of people who are not ready to fight back, fall ill, when in fact, we will be returned to the Stone Age and everyone must survive on their own? The answer is obvious. Medical science will respond to this new threat only in several years or decades, when there's no one left to help. In the meantime, the hope remains that modern medicine and purified water, if of course you have them, can save you. But the snail is not our only partner in facilitating the life cycle of small creatures. For example, what do you think of the tsetse fly, which carries the sleeping sickness pathogen? Subscribe, and next time you'll learn even more.